which is um, averaging of the vaccination 2023 examination and regeneration. And we are excited to have our four debaters. <laughs> um, so I'm going to introduce Craig. Uh, this is Craig Lee. He is an academic team lead for tourism and hospitality and events at Robert Goddard University. And he's got a very wide industry experience. You're very knowledgeable. <laughs> um, and he um, has some of research interests, including tourism, and his current PhD research is focused on the soul tourism experience. And so I'm going to introduce Kirsten. So this is Kirsten now. She is a first class TV events management project for RGA. And during her time at RGA, she was named best overall student for events management in fourth year as well as Catherine's in year as part of the RGA Royal Indian project. Um, now she is currently a lecturer, a very good lecturer. I didn't write that. <laughs> Yeah, she's all right. <laughs> um, and she's also studying for Masters in Business Administration. Um, and I'll be introducing Professor Lee. Um, he is a professor here at Robert Brown University, and his research covers areas including management of cultural services in the glam sector. So this includes the galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, and also the management of the cultural heritage, which is particularly as it relates to the northeast of Scotland. And last but not least, we have Rachel, Dr. Rachel Ironside. Um, Rachel is a senior lecturer and researcher in events and tourism at Aldergrove University. Um, her research interests concern engagement between folklore, place heritage, and communities. Um, she has published widely on issues concerning social interaction um, and extraordinary experience and supernatural folklore um, as a form of tourism and heritage protection. We hope you enjoy um, our debate and we'll get started. <laughs> So we're going to be asking guys questions and kind of just keeping the debate going. So I guess the first um, question is kind of what are the major changes that you guys think need to be made to Aberdeen just to regenerate? From now going forward? Yeah. I'll mention before we <laughs> um, I think it, my view is I think there's been a lot of changes in the last few years just before COVID. We talked about PJ, we talked about the cruise. Mm -hmm. I guess the technical concerns about how valuable the cruise industry is going to be for the city. Um, whatever magic has gone on in Unitair um, Startups. So I think going forward is the case of how all that ties in together. Um, and is there a buy in both from the local community and the tourists and the tourist industry? To actually get the businesses to come up and kind of uh, take advantage of all these new developments that have already happened and almost, almost finished. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, I'm obviously interested in kind of storytelling, um, but I think um, Aberdeen struggles in terms of understanding its, its identity and the story it wants to tell. Um, it's kind of relationship with the industry, it's a bond of this industry it's previously had around Kauai like us. Um, the fact that that still exists um, in the city as a, as a strong industry, um, but having a lot of other assets, and I'm sure Peter will talk a little bit about the sort of heritage you know, that the um, Abbey can offer, but um, you know, understanding what story it has and how that informs the identity of Aberdeen as a, as a tourism destination going forward. So I think it needs to understand its story perhaps um, better um, in terms of being able to regenerate and, and then understand what it needs to invest in moving forward. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, Rachel. I don't think it does understand its story. Um, and I think it, it misses the boat, um, no pun intended about cruises, but it misses the boat. Um, and it comes up with too many um, hair-brained ideas in terms <laughs> of um, regeneration and redevelopment. And I think in the last 10 years, we've going, been going to turn um, Woman Hill Hospital into a museum, Norco House into a museum, um, and now we're going to have a big oil rig station, uh, a decommissioned oil rig um, station off the harbour as a museum. Um, so we've got three museums that have never happened. We've had a city centre master plan that's gone on for 
well, it seems like hundreds of years um, and hasn't actually delivered particularly on it. So I think there's huge, huge opportunity um, in the city and um, culturally and um, socially in heritage terms, in tourism terms, economically. Um, but I think we need a clearer picture of um, the shape of that. I would agree. I think we're trying to regenerate here in Aberdeen, but how well that's going and how well that's perceived is maybe <laughs> questionable. I um, haven't had quite a few conversations with my own students in classes around this topic. The general kind of discussion is why should people stay here and what, you know, students and things, why, and what are we doing to encourage them to stay? And at the moment, maybe not a huge amount. So in terms of our student population, I think we need to be doing more to encourage them to stay, whether that's through museums and things, maybe it is, maybe it's not. I think we are trying, but we're just not quite hitting the mark just yet. <laughs> can I, so can I just pitch and pick up point that Peter made about these uh, huge, big uh, museums that haven't yet happened. There's a lot of talk at the moment about if we have a cable car down at the harbour, that will solve the problem and tourists from all over the world will come to Aberdeen for two weeks to sit in a cable car, I mean, quite facetious, obviously. <laughs> I don't see why spending multi millions of pounds even a lot of it refunding on something like that. There seems to be an image, oh, we don't have something iconic, we don't have the Kelpies. We don't have the VA Museum. I think from what Rachel and Peter both said, there's an awful lot of stuff within Aberdeen if we get that right and get the story right. I think looking into the crystal ball, we could spend £100 million pounds doing a cable car, we've got lots of good press, and then I think very quickly bad press, and that way, I think it's a massive risk to improve the reputation of Aberdeen as a leisure destination. So that's my on record, don't like the idea of a cable car. <laughs> Do we have a destination? <laughs> Well, I think we're trying to develop that, and I think uh, I think it would take something. I mean, you just look at the. Remember, they, down in London, they spent about five million pounds doing a fake hill down at Oxford Street area, and that was bad. But what made it worse was once the media picked up on it, and said it was bad. Nobody went to it, and I do think multiplying that by hundreds to build a cable car, I just don't see the sense of that, and I also think it run the risk of making us. I might be entirely wrong, and most people within Aberdeen. Who think it's the right thing? I think it's run a massive risk to make a wee bit of a laughing stock and put people off. So that's my view on the cable car. Yeah, I think when you've got sort of basic frustrations when you go down Union Street and maybe see the types of shops and things like that, which inform that city centre, the idea of just that maybe remaining as it is and having a cable car is, <laughs> so, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, I love Aberdeen. I was born in Aberdeen. Um, I've spent my whole career working in Aberdeen um, and I want Aberdeen to succeed um, and I think there have been germs of good bits of vision but we've never actually developed them to, to get to an end point. Um, I'm only being half facetious about the, the city centre master plan seems to be on the go forever um, and Union Street, if you read the Press and Journal letters pages, um, regularly as I do, um, because it's the best barometer of what the Northeast is thinking. Um, you know, there's, there's serious depression about the state of Union Street. Um, and I think back to even when I was um, at the ages of, of you folks as an undergraduate, um, Union Street was a flagship street. Now, I may be harking back to the good old days, but you do go to other cities um, where the, the main centre, the main street, the main thoroughfare is far more engaging. And I think we have to start with the heart of the city um, and then work out what we mean by having artisan quarters or arts and crafts quarters or, or whatever. Um, we do a lot of the grand vision stuff. I don't think we ever get anywhere with it. Yeah, I, I would agree. And kind of, I was born and raised here as well. So, I, you know, I, I love the place. Like I'm still here for a reason. I just think our priorities are in the wrong place in terms of regeneration. The, the, the signs above the streets, the light up signs, someone's seen those. Necessary. Probably not right now. <laughs> I think there's... Uh, oh, sorry, I was just going to say that uh, what Peter said. 
I think the struggles that Aberdeen particularly in the city centre are facing and the same struggles that other cities are facing and um, move towards the shopping centres like that, God for safe place down at the train station uh, and other places and let's move away and you see the types of shops and the empty units within, uh, within the industry. But I think we've got an advantage over a lot of cities because we're talking literally one street here and there's a lot of the empty um, properties above the shops, can, I think, easily made, made residential. Once you get people in there, they're suddenly, as you said, Peter, going out to you're in you're in your flat in middle of Union Street, and you're popping down of an evening and having a coffee or different bars, different centres open there in the city centre. I we have a condensed small city, and I think there's an opportunity to kind of take advantage of that, which I see a lot of cities don't have, but. Then straight away we're saying we're going to have the buses going to open up Union Street when I think we've missed an opportunity that won't come again. Um, so that's just a bit sad. Um, following on from the discussion about Union Street, um, there's plans for it to be developed and pedestrianised. Uh, we're wondering what your thoughts are on this and whether it would be beneficial to respective industries. We're also like to ask <laughs> I would like, I mean, I, I like it as it is at the moment. I do understand, you know, I saw one of the letters actually in the PNJ um, was talking about accessibility into the city centre and, and the concerns that, that causes, but I don't think we need to reopen it to traffic necessarily to, I um, you know, I think these are the ways that we can ensure that the industry is accessible. Um, but I'm just going to talk from a, um, a good tour guiding perspective actually because I've done ghost tourism in the city centre and I did one I'm back in October for the alumni office and it's really difficult to do those ghost tours or any type of tour in the city centre when you've got traffic and buses and all of that going on in the city centre um, and Aberdeen has such potential for its heritage and its history and all sorts of other tours going on um, but when I did the, the one back in um, October, uh, it, was, it was a lot easier because a lot more of it was pedestrianised, it was a lot quieter um, in the city centre. So I, I think we're missing out on certain things because it's really difficult when there is lots of traffic going up and down that route um, to be able to do this. But that, that's just one sort of element that I think of the advantages that on, there are. On that, yeah, I agree with what Rachel said. I don't say the reason for news week. Yes, there's accessibility issues, but is that not just something we don't come quite easily? And I wonder how many of the cars that are going through Union Street are actually going far. I mean, there's bypasses and everything, so that must be city centre traffic. We're meant to be stopping that. So, sure, again, to go back to, I just think it's been a massive missed opportunity, unless it's rethought, um, just ban traffic through Union Street. And, yeah. I can understand that there's a constituency of people who are against um, pedestrianising it. But there's been a constituency against pedestrianisation in virtually every city that has ever tried it. Um, and invariably, in most cases, it becomes um, a success. Um, I'm forever banging on about Copenhagen, but Copenhagen's main street was pedestrianised really, really early. Um, and the shopkeepers were up in arms and various businesses were up in arms and um, car drivers were up in arms. Um, and it became a huge success very, very quickly. Um, I think we have missed an opportunity, but I think we've, you know, I go back to what I say about the whole um, city centre. We have the Castle Gate, which is an absolutely phenomenal space. Um, it's so full of um, history on so many different levels. It's got fabulous cultural infrastructure in there, like Peacock um, uh, Visual Arts. Um, and we don't make the most of the the Castle Gate or the, the Salvation Army Citadel. Um, we've got Belmont Street, Little Belmont Street, we've got Upper Kirkgate. All of these need to be planned. And I, I'm going to say it, we've got the abomination in Marshall Square. <laughs> Why that couldn't have been a city square, I will never know. Aberdeen needs to be restaurants. <laughs> well, we're short on restaurants. <laughs> I agree. I think the pedestrianisation of the industry is good. And as a, kind of, as a driver, I wouldn't I don't even consider driving down it anymore. Like I don't think if it was unpedestrianised, I would feel the need to drive down. I just don't, I think we're all kind of used to it now. 
But it's not just a case of just pedestrianising it. What else are we going to do to draw people there? We can't leave it. We can't just pedestrianise it and leave it as it is. It's there's no reason to go there right now unless you want a charity shop, a bookies, or a vape shop. And that's that's <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think that really falls in line with what we're trying to do and the vision that we're trying to create for ourselves as a cultural destination, historical destination. So it's yes, it's a good idea to keep it pedestrianised, but there's so much more behind that that is going to take a lot of time, a lot of work, and a lot of planning. Thank you. Sorry, I was just going to ask um, from a student perspective, it would be really interesting from anyone in the audience to kind of what your perception of that is, because we, I, as someone that I was born in, I kind of read Aberdeen, you know, you street when I was younger. And um, was kind of a place that you went to town and you spent time in the street. Craig obviously loves UK Square. <coughs> but what's your perception of that? Which, is it Union Square? Is it Union Street? What do you guys think? Okay, I have a question to kind of all the students. Yeah. Like, um, is there Microphone. any comments <laughs> 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 I was just thinking, so when you have it pedestrianised, you maybe reintroduce the trams that we had so many years ago, and like say instead of having buses going through Marshall Square, they have the trams going that way, maybe connecting the streets to the airport, like you do with um, Princess Street in Edinburgh, connecting it to the airport, like that kind of thing. I think this is kind of the point that there are other things that we can do, whether that's the tram or it's some of the you know, form of system that enables accessibility but allows these spaces to be utilised more. I mean, pedestrianisation, you know, talk about this for anybody, think about the event spaces that could be created in places like Castlegate and Union Street and those connecting streets we were talking about. You know, if anyone's been to the New Art Festival or the Jazz Festival when that's been hosted outside, and some of those spaces, even when Union Street was, you know, um, opened up, were great to. Part, you know, bringing a real life into the city, and you can imagine how Union Street could be such a vibrant place for events and activity and street performers and things like that. Because it, I mean, it is a it's a great yeah. space, and the architecture is beautiful as well. So I think that ideally we should be ambitious. Ambitious doesn't mean spending eighty million pounds on a cable car. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, Union Street think about. Exhibitions means have have different zones, have an area, it's got a few outdoor cafes, etc. You've got all the residential looking over this, you're looking over like a kind of mini central park idea. There's it's such a nice and once you get rid of the if you don't have the road, you don't need to pay it's suddenly that is so wide. As long as you're a bit ambitious and thinking of all the different things uh, you can do with it. Yeah, I think if you look at the cultural um, events do take place, I'm thinking particularly of Spectre a couple of months ago. Um, you know, I've worked with Curated Place and Andy Bright on, on, on a couple of projects, and I know I know how hard they work to put um, things like um, Spectre together. There's an appetite for it. I'm not, you know, advocating that we should have high-end culture. I think high-end culture is really important. Um, I would say that with Kathy looking at me. But, um, you know, I, I think I, I, I do value high culture, but I think culture is for everyone in every shape and form and spectra is as much culture as, as um, the opera I was at last um, Wednesday night. Um, I, I'm quite relaxed if Aberdeen becomes a destination for um, hen nights and, and stag parties, you know, in the way that um, <laughs> Belfast or Dublin or, or Newcastle um, have become. I think if that's managed well and that's managed effectively, I want people to come, but I'm just not convinced that we've got the right recipe for getting them to come at the moment. Sorry. No, you don't. Yeah, I was going to say, I think you can get people to fall in love with the buildings we have again. And I think sometimes as you're walking on the pavements along the road on Union Street, you don't look up, you know, you don't see, and we've got like, spectacular buildings. I mean, next time you walk down Union Street, look up. Because we've got amazing architecture, I mean, iconic buildings like um, Marshall College and, um, you know, the theatre, but, but also the Union Street buildings, you know, there's beautiful architecture around there. And I think we, we need to fall in love with that again. And one of the ways you can do that is bringing people off that side's pavements and, and allowing that to, to open up more. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> no, I was just kind of building on the, the tram point. Obviously, yeah, lots of um, logistical issues around that. And, whether you want the whole Union Street to be 
be pedestrianised or include trams, et cetera, et cetera. I think extending that out into the Shire perhaps as well, you know, there's a lot of people don't come into Aberdeen from Aberdeen Shire because parking's extortionate, it's kind of a hassle to get in. There's not really that much there for them to do unless they want to go shopping. But if you can make it easy, convenient, relatively cheap to get people in and out of the city, offer them opportunities, things to do, museums, all that kind of stuff. Why not? Like, well, why aren't we going down that route? One thing that I would like to show you, Lisa, I'll just make this point. And um, the, the one thing that I would hark back to um, is the attitude that I had as a child or maybe up until my mid-teens about coming into Aberdeen. I grew up, you know, 60 odd miles um, that way. And coming into Aberdeen was a big thing. Now, admittedly, people didn't travel as, as far in, in, in those olden days. Um, but coming into Aberdeen was an experience because you had a, a shopping street in the form of Union Street that surpassed anything that we could get locally. There was a theater, you know, there was the art gallery, there were all of these things. And it was a much greater experience. And um, I don't know how to put it. It was, it was something, um, it was something really out of the ordinary. Now, admittedly, we've become, we've become much more familiar. You can get in, in and out of Aberdeen much more easily now. But I would like to recapture some of that sense of it being something special. That's how I grew up as well. It was, like, it was a thing. It was a thing to, to come yeah. into town. And I don't have that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, <was it>? um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Lisa, you were saying and the way I see it is um, when the pedestrian zone was introduced, it, it was supposed to be like a, a prototype for the every uh, citizen to show this is how it would be when it is pedestrianized. And that's why I have my issues with it. They are not doing anything with it. Everybody's just like, yeah, okay, we can have it or not. Um, we should introduce like food stalls, um, flea markets, typical things that happen in the city center and actually use the marketplace we already have make it a little bit more like um, if local farmers are placed, like this is what in Germany happens. So uh, farmers markets, flea markets, um, but nothing like that happens. So I feel like, okay, it's pedestrianized, but nothing's happening there. Can I, sorry, I think of two things. One thing I think when we pedestrianize, it's because of COVID. So I think we were very limited in what we could. We could just obviously pedestrianize because of COVID, they have lots of farmers markets. So I think even though things are open, they still be there, right? Things were opening up. There was still that mixed message, I think, going on about what we were able to do and what restrictions. I think it was, it, it was a good opportunity, but we were limited in what we could do. <clears throat> I also think we need to be very careful about not just trying to copy what works somewhere else. You're talking about farmers markets in Germany, but that's been growing, that's been part of maybe the support of the German culture for a long period of time. Maybe we don't. I mean, I might be wrong, just saying, I think there's what you maybe look to see that could be get different ideas and say what may can be adapted to may work more here. Uh, we've, we've, we do the wee farmers markets on Belmont Street, is it every month or so? And I just wonder how sustainable something like that is if it was more of a kind of common type thing. I don't know, that's just my Yeah, there's farmers markets in Aberdeenshire every weekend in different areas. So if you want to go, there is that opportunity already. So I think the frustration is, to some extent, is that this decision about pedestrianisation seems to be taking place at a time when we have really had the opportunity to embrace some of these things post-COVID. So, you know, we're maybe making a decision about something working well at a time when you can't really experiment. So, so I mean, it would have fed into the whole issue with COVID because we had to be outside social distancing. So when you had like food trucks, for example, you mask on, um, you can eat, walk around, so it would have been an opportunity to actually make it a little bit more vibrant, um, giving small businesses a chance to represent themselves, so that's why I would say it's not a jam thing to do, yes. it's like um, giving people the chance to make more greener decisions of actually supporting local farmers and not just buying the plastic wrap stuff in the supermarkets when there is the opportunity, it's easy, each week everybody can just come in. I think that comes down to a kind of 
like an inherent change in the way people view things though as well you know, you've got to encourage people and persuade people that buying local is better and not going to tesco is the right idea and that's huge like that's a really that's gonna be a really challenging perception to change and not a short-term one either so i get what you're saying <coughs> And that's the thing, think, more to it. Yeah, I think if, if it was more a kind of transform transformative change to Union Street, it becomes more appealing to have the things that you've talked about there. I think we would just keep Union Street the way it is, we just get rid of traffic and let's have some stalls, etc. I don't know if there's enough there for people, as you said, to kind of change your consumer behaviour. But suddenly, if the whole thing is changed, and Union Street is, a, is an area now that allows all this thing to come and it's got the guards, it's got the zones, I think that itself, so it's maybe a case of quite often say like start small go big maybe what it does need is a massive change and then suck everything else into it i was going to say going with what kirsten was saying um, a lot of young people now want to shop local they want to get rid of plastic so have if you maybe implement these things they might bring more young people to have been like especially students if they want to come to a place where they know that they can do the shop locally and reduce their carbon footprint they might act doing these things just like saying like oh we're going to try it this whole weekend and you can see how the turnout is and then same with like local bars, like well, Lisa was saying, and um, like down the street, there's not been, been that many farmers markets recently there. It's a couple of times now I've been in town, usually the days are just supposed to happen, they haven't. So maybe like local bars, like say like say the EDR Hotel, they could bring it on to Union Street to save students like going all the way down to Belmont Street. They can have it a little bit further up if it's like just that one half. So I mean, people can just go sit out and have like a, like a little pop up bar or something occasionally. And again, they are inter I'm interested to know why these farmers markets you said they're advertised to be on and they're not on. Is that because there's not been a buy in from the farmers? Do they maybe not see it worth their time and money to come spend the day in Aberdeen? There must be a reason why it's been advertised, it's not actually happened. And that's my concern. Is there an actual need for that at the moment? I like the idea of the kind of the pop up bar, even the cafes in Belton Street were doing that very well. Even the Kill had a, 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 a wine terrace. I never thought the Kill would ever have a wine terrace. And um, so there's opportunities there. Not a woman's toilets. Though. Of course not. There's only so far transform transformative change can go. I think, I don't know if you guys have seen Shipburn Village, but I think that's something that they're actually trying to do at the moment on a smaller scale. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how they succeed with that and if that can then be implemented on a larger scale towards Union Street, perhaps. I don't know. About 25 years ago, they pedestrianised the main street in Elgin. Um, and it met with all the resistance that I've spoken about um, earlier. Um, and pre-COVID, they had really successful um, farmers markets. Now, that was not a thing before pedestrianisation. So I think there is a, a degree to which that if you do it, it will succeed if the environment is, is, is right. Um, but it, it's interesting if, if there's maybe less of an appetite, you know, it's, uh, in the past, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, or Aberdeen and the Northeast, was always viewed through, viewed through the lens of town and country. There was still a garage, I think, called um, town and country, but that was, that was almost a, a motto to connect the city and the shire and, and beyond. And I wonder sometimes if we've lost that sense of, of town and country. Um, you know, we're now surrounded in, in Bankery in, um, in Faruri in Ellen and so on, with do effectively dormitory towns for, for the city. And I don't know if that's maybe changed the sense of identity both in the city and out in the Shire. I, I don't know, I don't have an answer to that. Yeah, you know that's that's a really important point, and I think Elgin is a very sadly a very good example of all the problems with with town centres. Um, you know, there are notable exceptions in the Northeast. Um, I think Inverudi has a really vibrant town centre. I think Tariff has a really vibrant town centre. I think, you know, I, I live um, 10 miles from Elgin. Um, I think Elgin's town centre, there's very little to take you into the, the 
the town centre. And sadly, I think we've replicated that in Aberdeen. If you build big shopping centres like Bonacord in the 90s um, and then Union, um, Union Square more recently, we've sucked shops away from um, from Union Street, so you wonder if it becomes self-fulfilling in the same way as Edgar Road and Elgin, you know, sucked out necks, it sucked out boots, um, and, you know, there's no reason to go down the main street. I hope we don't get to that, though we might be quite close to that with Union Street, as it is. I think these things just, you know, I think these things happen very, very quickly. I don't know if anybody here knows Kirfin in my hometown. And Gibbon used to be a really bad street, the same kind of very vibrant uh, Main Street, the Rimple Street. Um, a couple of small changes, a big Asda at the end of the town, so a lot of shops left. My dad shut his bakery, and another couple of things happened. And a few months ago, Gibbon Town Centre was voted the worst Main Street in the UK, <laughs> which my friends say great delight to tell me. That's happened within five or six years. And I, I think it's one of the same idea, just because Aberdeen's a bigger city, exactly the same thing can happen. I don't want to hog it, but I think where we can learn, learn some really instructive lessons. Uh, anybody from the Broch here? Anybody, Fraser? Um, you know, the Fraser Borough 2020 project, which is, is rolling out now because of COVID, um, they've, they've looked really creatively at, at what needs to be done in Fraser Borough. And one of the key things was actually at the state of the buildings. There were so many shop fronts and, and buildings that were neglected and, and obviously the project can't do everything but it's done, made a huge difference in particular pockets in um, Fraserborough and you know if that leads to boutique hotels or that leads to um, individual sole traders or artisans and crafts or, or new pubs or whatever and that helps regenerate the town centre well well done and I think Generally, in the northeast, we often see this happening more effectively in small towns than we perhaps do in Aberdeen itself. Well, not that I need it, but for your recording. Um, yeah, I think you're quite right, Peter, and I think what makes the difference in places like in Brewery, back in my home uh, stamping grounds of North Yorkshire, in those small market towns, is that in many instances that redevelopment was partly from the ground up if in Inverurie you have the big business improvement district and they made a point of coming out to us as residents that's I live in Inverurie um, to see what would we want what do we want to see there and I think any another crazy idea of um, living above the shops in Union Street, it was presumably originally people lived above the shops, um, as they did in London and Leeds and Bradford and elsewhere. Um, but you've got to have that engagement with those people who are going to live there. And I kind of feel it's a shame in many ways, I understand the reasoning for it, but student accommodation out here has pulled a whole vibrant community away from the city centre and it's called, you know, you, you, presumably a student should either have your own transport or you've got to rely on buses to get in and out to the nightlife or else the nightlife is going to grow here which will be an even further drag away from a vibrant city centre. And I, I like the idea of putting stuff in um, flea markets and what have you, I agree entirely that it doesn't want to be just a carbon copy of what happens elsewhere. I don't come into the German markets when they, when they come, used to come pre-COVID because I could go to Edinburgh, I could go to almost any other city centre and see exactly the same stores on the whole and get exactly the same food which may or may not be um, authentic. Uh, so I think it starts from the ground up uh, and I don't know uh, whether whoever's in charge of all the plans for Aberdeen, the city council or, or its fire or whatever, actually takes the temperature of the residents mm -hmm. and the different groups of residents who are there. So I think that's a good place to start as any. I think we saw that with the Green and Terrace debate. I think re reading the comments on like the Evening Express articles on Facebook and stuff suggests the same thing. I don't think that's the person here that doesn't read the local press. <laughs> 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 
that's just going to follow on from kind of everything we've discussed so far. Thank you. And <laughs> um, so there's been a lot of discussion about kind of saving Aberdeen City Centre. Um, and I know we've all got kind of different opinions, different areas of expertise. Like Craig says, he's got a lot of stuff about cruises. Rachel, you're into the dark tourism scene. We've got <laughs> museums, we've got events. So our question is, um, do you think Aberdeen is a notable destination at the moment? Um, if not, <laughs> what can be done to make it so? And what do you think is our best strategy? Out of everything you're interested in. Well, I don't think we are the world class destination at the moment. And uh, the patrons probably fed up. <coughs> that was fed up me here. Says, I see absolutely no reason why Aberdeen cannot become the one's needed destination for well-being and well wellness tourism. Everything we've got in terms of the the kind of people already come for the weather, the landscape, the scenery, the food, we've got that. So we're not having to reinvent something we don't have, but we market it, we sell it. As if you're coming from anywhere around the world, if you want the high class spas at two thousand pound a night, fine. <coughs> That's Cathy's market. If you want kind of like for five pound a night out camping out under the stars and everything, just the stargazing, absolutely fine. We can cover all bases. We could, I think, become the one of huge amount of ambition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's not having to, as I say, come up with something we don't have at the moment. So forget about the cruises. If cruise passengers want to come and want to take advantage of our high class spas and everything, brilliant. But become the one of the world's leading destination and will be to us. Which, which, well, <laughs> it's just one question. I think mean, mostly referring to Aberdeen Shire at the moment with the things we listed. I mean, that's good because city. I think it's city and Shire because well-being isn't just, it's like physical well-being, spiritual well-being, um, intellectual well-being. We've heard Peter and Rachel talk about all the culture and the history we've got, but so we could be bring some intellectual well-being, wellness into that as well. It's a shire that would bring people, but I think if you've got, if you're marketing yourself as that, you need to start thinking about the city as well. Look at the parks we've got, look at the riverside, but we can take advantage of that. And I think the only way, again, but it's a transformative change, I think the only way we would do that is to say that's the target we need to become. Then we need to get our finger out and actually start, start thinking ahead. I suppose, um, from my perspective, I mean, I, I get quite frustrated that we don't, Think more about heritage and history. I mean, I think we would be careful not. It's kind of what we were saying before about you know, flea markets and things. You know, not to just copy for the destinations. You know, I think um, or maybe Peter will say a little bit more about this to some extent. It's about knowing your heritage um, and ensuring that that is part of the story itself. Um, from the dark tourism perspective, you know, there's huge opportunities. In, in Aberdeen, I know St Nicholas is Kirk, for instance, um, there's been development that's been spoken about around that. Um, that's got a, an amazing history connected to uh, the witch trials uh, in Aberdeen and some of the excavations that have taken place there. I know in, in Marshall College, we've got a whole exhibition of Egyptian collection down there, which isn't even on display for people to see. So um, there's a huge amount of assets that we have in Aberdeen. I mean, I mentioned the ghost stories I've done. We've got loads of this, you know, isn't just in the Shire, this is within our city centre, um, you know, in terms of the various stories, whether that's dark, whether that's more connected to the people in the history, but really compelling stories within the city that are quite unique and different um, within Aberdeen. Um, that we don't make the most of, but those have the potential to draw lots of different types of audiences in. Um, so I think there's a real potential there to sort of make the most of that, um, but it does require a different, a different perspective on terms of what we have at the moment. It's not just oil. It's not just oil. <laughs> I think for a long time Aberdeen did um, rely very heavily, perhaps too heavily, on um, business related tourism connected with the oil and gas um, sector. And to a certain extent, we've only discovered um, the, the power and the potential of tourism more generally, and indeed arts and culture, um, or the decision makers have only discovered this relatively recently in the last 10 to 15 years, maybe since the 2008 um, downturn. Um, I think it's, it's wholly um, ridiculous to try and market Aberdeen 
in on its own. I think Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire must market collectively um, because there's there's an awful lot of people who will come for the um, the hill walking or the castles or you know up on Speyside and the Malt Whiskey Trail and, and, and all the rest of it. But there needs to be a powerful draw for these people who come to the northeast to come into um, the city. One of the things that really, really annoys me, and I'm going to get, I'm going to get the key for the five for this. When we get a new senior manager in the university, they invariably I'm, I'm going for it. <laughs> they, Steve doesn't want to be associated with this. <laughs> they, they, they invariably tell us um, that they've been attracted here for the hill walking. Now that's brilliant. I'm really happy that people want to enjoy the great outdoors and go and experience the D side or the um, the Cairn Gorms or Ben McDewey or whatever it might be. But I would love someone to say that they were attracted by the, the culture of the Northeast as well. And it's not just senior managers in the university, but when you get that potted biography, there's nearly always that hill walking um, reference. Um, that's great, but there's so much more that I think um, we, we could do. A few years ago, when I did my professorial lecture, I subtitled it, The Things That We've Forgotten to Remember. Um, and I think that's really important, connected to what Rachel was saying about the stories that we need to share, the narratives that we need to put out there. I don't know how many of you have followed the debate, um, the press and journal this time, rather than Evening Express, about the lack of female statues in Aberdeen. Sarah Pedersen, our colleague here, um, wrote the article. The only female statue in Aberdeen is Queen Victoria. Now she doesn't count because she's a monarch. No one is actually, no woman is actually commemorated for their own achievements. And yet there are incredible, phenomenal stories of women in the Northeast that should be should be shared, whether it's Mary Garden or Fenella Payton um, or screeds of, of others. We're not alone in this, but we have forgotten to remember. And we need to do a bit more of the remembering and the storytelling and telling our heritage and culture. There is, there I'm is, going to be sacked now. There is, there is, there is something about the culture has got nothing to do with it. Yes, absolutely. And you can debate whether or not there is such a thing as popular culture. You know, is that an oxymoron? And there's former members of staff here who would have argued that that was an oxymoron. I think it's just really great to mention about you know, business tourism and. You know, I mean, I, I know, you know, PNG Lies we talk about this and recognize, you know, that with business tourism, it also needs the forms of tourism and culture, and you know, these are the things that make people stay in a, in a destination. So there's sort of very little point focusing on business tourism that we're not then investing in culture and other aspects of, of the Northeast, because otherwise people come here, they go for business, and then they return home, and they go, well, we went to that place, there's very little to do other than the conference that we went to. What we want to do is bring people in and bring people back because they come on holiday or they stay extra days. So, um, Aberdeen probably needs some of its businesses that are more recognised to invest in its culture. Um, so then I'll say, oh, that race helps. <laughs> Um, there's literature about um, how cultural and heritage tourism, as well as art tourism, can um, well, regenerate urban, well, urban regeneration. Sorry, do you think that's the way Aberdeen should go about um, using the elements we already have here, but promoting them, using them to to regenerate the city, or should we first regenerate the city and then develop more tourism and that cultural tourism? I think it's like incredible assets in the city that we should be. And I think it leads on to and Kathy's point as well of you know it's, it's the bottom-up approach of working with the with the community to understand what do people want to see, what do people feel does represent them, you know, how do we develop those things? And I, I think tourism comes from that as long as you then build the infrastructure and the marketing and everything that shit needs to be built in that. It's a holistic perspective, I think, that needs to be taken, but we have such strong assets, it would be a shame. Not maybe so can I just add out that this for maybe for that yeah but that also includes the local community as well. And I mean Peter's saying there about sort of the um 
female historical figures who by the way should have snatch others. I don't know if they mentioned there. So it, it, it needs more of us. And that's maybe something us within a university, we have to be more appreciative of what, what we have out there, but these all aspects of the community to buy to buy into as well. Sorry, this um just a, a comment to what uh, Peter said about marketing um Aberdeen with Aberdeenshire company and I would disagree a little bit because um, Aberdeenshire always seems to get the most attention out of the world. So like when you look up traveling to Aberdeen, everything you like is advertised to look at is usually not in the city centre, mostly in Aberdeenshire. So I would actually try to develop an image for Aberdeen city by itself to actually get this identity going and to get a little bit more independent from the Shire. I don't disagree with that, actually, um, even though it's not what I said, but I don't disagree with that. Um, I think you've got to ask yourself, why does the city piggyback as much as it does on the Shire? Um, and I think that's maybe lying behind takes reticence about the, the cruise tourism. You know, if, if you come into Grado Bay on a cruise liner, um, you want to experience the essence of the Northeast in the five hours that you're here. So you go to a distillery and you go to a castle um, and then you go back to the cruise liner. Tell me the distillery in Aberdeen that you go to and tell me the castle in Aberdeen that you go to. You don't. You go out to Glengarry Distillery and you go to Crathers Castle and then you're back on the on the boat. So I, I, have, I think the, the sad reality is that we're slightly, maybe even more than slightly, confused about what we're trying to market in Aberdeen. And therefore we go, oh well, there's golf courses out in the showers distilleries out in the Shire, there's castles, there's Pictish stones, and so on. But I don't agree, I don't disagree at all that Aberdeen maybe needs a clearer identity and marketing strategy of its own. It used to be, not that long ago, it used to be worse, it used to be is it Aberdeen as a city, and then various other DMOs round about the Shire, and the decision was taken to put them all together for a number of reasons. One reason is so the city could always take advantage of, of the Shire. So it's been a bit more kind of joined up thinking that way. I think one of the reasons when you look at all the market material and everything, you're right, a lot of it is shire focused. But that's what people want. So it goes back to maybe what they're saying. Make the city something that deserves to be front and central of the marketing. And at the moment, we probably don't have that. So change that. And it... <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Katie. I was going to say, so you're about like things being now being like on it almost. Um, kind of do what like Edinburgh and um, London have done with the Christmas market and things. Like, there's a lot of people that will go down to London <coughs> just to go to the for a Christmas market, or like travel down to Edinburgh to do that. And also, people go to Oxford Street to see the iconic Christmas lights that they have every year. Do you think we can maybe improve our Christmas market and kind of expand it so people will want to maybe come up from say places like Glasgow and Edinburgh? See what we have to offer, or even like improve our Christmas lights to fit with the theme of Aberdeen City to kind of like utilize the buildings, like to make the plants of lights and some of the great architecture we have as well. Yeah, we could do that. I mean, my music is on that, but if we make the city and you can see more appealing all year round, then we can then fully take advantage of it at Christmas, make Christmas a massive, massive thing. But I think it's best to put the focus in and prove that, as I say, all year round, that's my I think that's a problem that we have with, and I feel like we do things in half measures. We don't, we just don't quite execute them 100%. We're trying, but we're just falling a bit short, and that's something that we really need to improve on in order to have that vibrant, all year round excitement, wanting people to come and visit, and notable events and things that will draw people in. Because at the moment, why would you choose our Queen's Christmas market over Edinburgh, for example? I guess that's it. It's you know, it's not just the lights, it's maybe the cafe culture, the shopping culture, everything else that would go with that, which you get funny I mean, draws people, but then people go, well, go back there. You know, that's that's something else. Um, I have a question. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you've been the microphone <laughs> so you're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So Rachel, we mentioned the BNJ life and the business events side of tourism, and plus the BNJ life are also bringing concerts and cultural events. In the city as well. So, what do you think the role of the creative, of what is happening in the creative industry, industries right now is um, for developing the future image of and for 
the city's rejuvenation uh, generation. You know, there's the new arts festival, there's all this stuff going on right now. Um, my question is to everyone, not just Rachel. Do you think the role that creative industries is? I mean, I think there's great stuff going on, and you know, particularly pre-COVID, and you know, we mentioned some of the festivals today around, you know, Spectra and the New Art and the Jazz Festival, and I mean, there's, there's lots and lots of other festivals and, and events mentioned. Obviously, the PJ Live is a fantastic venue, you know, it's 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 amazing, and it is slightly outside the city centre, and that's that's a challenge um, because we've got some great events which are which are coming to Aberdeen, and people will be probably staying and travelling up here. Um, but we need things that are going to bring them back into the city centre as well as maybe stepping out of the PJ line or you know maybe staying near Aberdeen but just going out to the PJ line and, and then going home as well. But um, you know, I mean, I think it's difficult at the moment because we're coming out of COVID and some of these things have obviously been cancelled. But when you start to look at the um, events calendar coming in for this year, there's fantastic things coming up, and I think we need to use that momentum going forward to really capture that and, and try and drive the event calendar that's going to perhaps inform you know the future of that being going forward is an event that's an explanation. Another thing I would add to it is you think about what would be the regeneration. I think sometimes we think that's supposed to be something big, massive, and then who benefits from that and go back to Union Street. I think focusing Union Street is a fantastic resource if it's done correctly and that could benefit the local communities in terms of residential and businesses and that way of talking with tourists tourists want an authentic they want to that phrase the whole airbnb thing that i disagree with live life like a local well the local the tourist wants to come in and walk down the industry when there's people's flats there there's local people sitting in the cabins there's local people sitting in the the grass man the wee mini park that i've now decided to want to employ the industry so change the industry and that's regeneration without having to spend millions and millions of pounds for one iconic white elephant. I think there's a good Christmas. I don't know if I Christmas. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know because I, you know, I don't like Christmas, I'm not a hot dog, so I need Christmas I can't stay away from. I think the point you said there is that you look to move it somewhere else. Well, I think that's what it's going back to what Christmas said. I think so often now we, want, we keep doing the same thing because it kind of works. Maybe we need to start taking chances. Now, whether that's find a different zone or a better place, I don't know, but move away from the way that we've always kind of done it. I was just, just picking up on the, um, the idea of, of doing things more locally and getting more local input. That actually should have the benefit in that local people feel more engaged and local people therefore act as your ambassadors. I've been to cities around the world, I won't name any of them because I'm nice that way, um, but I've been places and I've actually managed places where the local people said, well, why are you coming here? Well, why not? Why, why are you here? And if you get that sort of response from the people when you go there, you think, well, okay, so maybe actually that's not as wonderful as I think it is. So if we can go back to engaging with local people and getting what they want and bring people back into the city centre locally, engender local pride, then that also ought to be done into the face of the BJ and the Evening Gazette and SDV local and visit Aberdeen Shire, uh, there I say it, so that those stories are getting out there and we understand as, as local residents what the stories are. Because at the moment it feels like you know, there's, a, there's a, a viewpoint over here that says we've got lots and lots of stuff we should be proud of, but it's kind of still being seagulled in. We don't need to be on that to see. I think that's an issue that we have. This, uh, there isn't that element of why are you here? Like, why have you chosen to visit Aberdeen? And like you say, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't foster pride. It doesn't, you know, it makes people think, okay, okay well, why did I come then? I don't know. Um, so yeah, I think we do have that element. I think 
I, I often think that we're still kind of stuck on this, but we were once this amazing city thanks to oil. And now that's not so much the case anymore. People are kind of lost. They don't quite know what to do. And we've just, we've not really got past that quite yet. I think we're trying, but we're still just, mm. I know, potential resistance to that. Yeah, and I think we're finding ourselves in a position that many of the, the northern industrial cities um, find themselves in 30 or 40 years ago and trying to reinvent themselves. Um, and I think, you know, in some places it's been done spectacularly well. Like, well, in fact, in many of the northern cities, you know, particularly if you look at um, Newcastle and Gateshead, um, the, the way they reinvented themselves in a post-industrial world, um, with the Sage and, and the Baltic and um, all the other interventions and, you know, great restaurants, great nightlife um, and so on. Just on that, so I want to put this there to see, because that's another point, we see, we've got an advantage, these cities, modern well, England went through it 30, 40 years ago. How many games do you think the city shire and councils are going down there and speak to people and seeing what work, what didn't work, what could we learn? It goes back to what you said, Lisa, about the idea of the German market, because I've got to show what to copy stuff, but surely there's opportunity. I think we know the answer. Of I, I kind of wonder as well if, I think Aberdeen is in a funny position because it, it's not lost its industry. It hasn't gone through the trauma of literally losing an industry and having to regenerate. It's kind of haunted by oil and gas. It's always back to the ghost. <laughs> But it is, you know, oil and gas is still there. It's still a, a successful industry in, in many ways with the city. So there isn't quite the same drive to really push away from that and, and find something to leave out of that trauma that sometimes comes with, with losing it. So I think it's in limbo to some extent. And maybe that's why there isn't sometimes that push. <laughs> <laughs>
the um, space of the industry. So it wouldn't be a public situation, it's more like we can put our own spin on it. But as the spend is stitched, sorry, I was getting mentioned. I was getting mentioned to you. I was getting Then do we get to the point of view of copy editor? And the point of say, maybe we go down a, a Christmas spooky winter <laughs> thing. Well, the, yeah. right, the culture and, the, and all that, and that becomes a thing. I was just going to say that actually. I mean, I. I've got a bit of frustration. I love Christmas. Like I love Christmas markets, but every Christmas market I've been to in the last like, five years has been the same. Like it's, it's literally the same schools. It's obviously the same company which you're bringing people in. So there possibly is an opportunity there to actually do a different Christmas market that is, you know, more local and more kind of authentic. Um, that that takes some work, you know, but I, I do think there's an opportunity there um, to get away from the commodification of Christmas markets, which we see. Really clearly, even in Edinburgh these days, I think it's changed quite a bit. So, more interesting for us. I just wanted to quickly say, probably like the last two questions because we are running short on time, and then we'll just get some base from you guys. Is that it? I don't know if I'm going to say this, but I think totally mis underestimated the, the impact and the concern of the, the spike. And, um, in terms of the hospitality, the hospitality industry is facing so many challenges at the moment in terms of, I know some of you guys work in terms of the staff shortage, the, the money to come in terms of higher fuel rates, etc. We think as well, pressure out to put on calorie information on menus, so, so many challenges. So the Wednesday that might be just another thing, and there must come a point that a business says, I just, I can't do this anymore, so it's maybe another, another straw to it. I just had an idea pop up out of nowhere. When we're talking about the Christmas market and the enthusiasm we've seen in that first spooky, what about the lighting? That being spin on the Christmas market, the style, uh, you know, nightmare for Christmas or something. Hey, I'm not afraid. Anyone else? I'm not even starting doing Christmas. <laughs> I think that's what Philip and I was trying to do, just take something that's there. How do you put a local spin on it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think it goes to our existing market, which is the Christmas market. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
um, but there's so much intangible stuff. And I think the focus is often on the tangible, maybe rather than the intangible. And you know, we maybe need to understand the role of intangible heritage in Aberdeen more fully and how that's going to link us to tangible stuff that's that's going on and, and actually probably costs less money. <laughs> and I think the visit visit Aberdeen, visit Aberdeenshire are becoming a bit more keyed up on the intangible um stuff. Um, you know, whether that's the, the delights of a buttery or it's you know loons and crimes on, on lavatory doors or whatever. Um, and, and Doric. Um, so I think um, there, there is, and I think more generally, Rachel and I know this from discussions we've had over the last couple of months. I think there's a much greater awakening of the importance of intangible cultural heritage and how it could be a draw if you do it right. But it's, it's how we do it right now. I agree with, with, with Kirsten a bit, you know. We, We've got loads of things in train, but oh, to see a few things at fruition and working would be brilliant. I think it goes back to that idea of getting people to come back to the city as well. If you're launching everything at once, what reason is there for them to come back again? Whereas if you're launching things staggered, oh, right, okay, well, that's happening. So we'll go for that. We'll go home again we're from wherever. In a few months' time, there's something else that's launching. Okay, so we'll actually head back to the city. And there's a kind of argument there that would encourage people to keep returning as opposed to just coming once and then potentially not coming back again. Last last December at our graduation ceremony, we gave Jane Spears, um, who's the retiring CEO of um, Aberdeen Performing Arts, we gave her an honorary doctorate. And in her address, Jane gave a really compelling vision of um, sort of culture and heritage and Aberdeen as a, a destination. And I wish somebody could bottle that and the decision makers outside Aberdeen Performing Arts, whether that's um, the City Council, whether it's one, whether it's Aberdeenshire Council, uh, whether it's Inspire, um, could have bottled that um, and, you know, put some of the things that were being um, posited there um, into action. Okay, well, thank you guys so much. Have you got any like final statements or advice in, in relation to what we talked about today? <laughs> I would just maybe go back to what David Coffer said earlier on, but you guys have confidence we're going into the workplace. Like that, but it needs confidence of what we've got as a destination. I think we're close to a lot of things, but as Luke Peter was saying, there, having the tangible without the associated intangible doesn't doesn't do enough. And the intangible is there. We just need to bring it to the forefront, I think. So I think there's a lot going on, but I think it was Chris that said, yeah, we do things half hearted, mm -hmm. just push forward. I think just to echo that, actually, you know, everyone sitting in the room here could do something. You know, I mean, I set up ghost talks when I was in third year at university and had a really successful business for a couple of years doing that. There's nothing to stop you guys going out and, you know, you want to run a spooky Christmas market. I'll help. I'm there. <laughs> like, you know, but honestly, like, what do you want to bring, you know, food markets to Aberdeen? Like, there's nothing to stop you being the ones to, to really um, bring that to the city. And, and I think it's yourselves that will make the change and make the impact and have your voices heard. So, can I just before Peter Kirsten? So, a really good example of that is Steve was out at the weekend on Friday, the reopening of the Great Hope Dolphin Centre. Now, that's one person that's really led that over a number of years and had an awful lot of challenges, but she had a passion for what she wanted to do, and she's now got something, and you say how random it was at the weekend. So if you suddenly want to do it, don't stop it, go and do it. Yeah, I, I would echo what, what Rachel's just said, and I would also go back to the um, point that Cathy made, um, that the best things come bottom up. The best things come when the community has buy-in and the community is engaged. And we know from those letters, columns, and comments on, online um, that there is a real passion in the city to make it better, to make it more attractive, whether that's um, for locals or visitors or both. And I think we all play a part in that. And you know, you folks going out um, when you, you graduate in, in um, a year or two's time, um, have that passion, have that commitment. And don't just leave it to other people, you know, old farts like me who've been in this for a long time um, and pontificate about it. Try and do 
but you folks are the future. Go out and have that passion and that commitment for whatever place you live in. And shout about all of the things that we do have. I think that's something that we do miss in our as well. We don't we don't shout about all of the amazing festivals we have and the the museums, everything. It's always after the fact that I often learn that something's happened. And that's no use to anybody. So be a part of the change that you want to see in the city, but also shout about what's what we already have as well. Um, I think we've had some very interesting, sorry, <laughs> I think we've had some very interesting discussion around the future of Aberdeen um, and these industries. Um, so I just want to take a moment to thank everyone in the audience for your participation and as well as our speakers today. <laughs>